David, feel free to start at any time. Great. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining the 12th in a series of webinars hosted by Uniting the Central Coast for Action, a program of the San Luis Obispo Climate Coalition. These webinars are focused on informing and inspiring local clean energy development and resilience. The recordings of prior webinars are available to watch on our website. That's slowclimatecoalition.org. I'm David. I'm your moderator for today. My teammates and I are excited to bring you today's program, which will examine how some of our state's community choice aggregators are charging ahead with their programs to help electrify our rides. Before we start, we are going to hear from our presenters first, then have a Q&A session at the end. So during the presentations, please enter your questions for our speakers into the regular chat stream, not the separate Q&A feature in Zoom, but the regular uh, chat stream. I will later direct those questions to one or more of our speakers in that last session. If we can't get to all the questions, we will seek to answer any remaining in writing afterwards. The Slow Climate Coalition deeply appreciates the support of our partner organizations, which helped promote this webinar. We continue working with our partners and with you and our audience to further the transition to clean energy and develop resilience in our communities. Please share your feedback on this webinar, as well as suggestions for subjects you want to hear more about in the future. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our first two speakers, both of whom are College Corps fellows working with the Uniting for the Central Coast for Action. First is Maya Petrovich. She is a fourth year student at Cal Poly studying environmental management and protection with a minor in psychology. Through her College Corps fellowship, she is gaining practical experience to help launch a career in sustainability while positively contributing to her community. Riley Chase is a third year student at Cal Poly studying environmental management and protection. She is engaging in College Corps projects that align with her dedication to climate action, and she is interested in a career in sustainability and environmental sciences. Please join me in a huge shout out for them both. Their hard work and dedication are what made today's webinar possible. Thank you. And now the two of you have the floor. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. I'm Maya Petrovich. And I'm Riley Chase. And we are delighted to have this opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing over the course of the last couple of months. Before we get started, um, here is an outline of how this webinar is going to unfold. We will briefly introduce the scope of our research, and then we'll delve into some key findings of the seven focus areas that we use to analyze the programs. This includes incentives for EVs, home chargers and charging, incentives for charging networks, workplace and multifamily charging, incentives for low-income and disadvantaged communities, programs for fleets and buses, and plans for V to G. Uh, after that, we will have three guest speakers from three different CCAs share some exciting and unique programs that they have going on. And following that, as David mentioned, there will be a Q&A session where we and the speakers will be able to answer any questions that you might have. So the purpose of this project was to survey current EV and EV charging programs of 12, 12 different uh, community choice aggregations. These community choice aggregations, which we'll refer to as CCAs, were deliberately chosen to represent a diverse spread with some of the oldest, newest, largest, and smallest CCAs spanning from San Diego to the Redwood Coast. The methodology for this project encompassed surveying CCA websites, emailing questionnaires, conducting interviews with CCA representatives, and having them review our data for accuracy. While looking at different CCAs, we decided that the best way to holistically evaluate their EV and EV charging efforts was to analyze seven different aspects, which we will call our focus areas. With this approach, we've compiled comprehensive data of how CCAs are charging ahead to help their customers electrify their rides. The goal of this project was to gauge the impact that each CCA has on its community, to document effective practices, and ultimately accelerate the sharing and adoption of innovative EV and EV charging programs. We just want to give a big thank you to all the CCA representatives for their time and collaboration and help in making this project possible. 
On the screen here are some acronyms that we will frequently refer to. We know that this is a lot to keep track of, so we've made an infographic with all the acronyms we're using for the CCAs as well as other ones. Um, and the link is in the chat for you now, so if you click on that, you'll be able to see that infographic. So the first aspect that we looked at were the incentives that CCAs provide to their customers for EVs. Three out of the 12 CCAs that we looked at currently offer their customers direct rebates for the purchase of an electric vehicle. Those are 3CE, PCE, and MCE, which you can see on the table. Marin Clean Energy is highlighted in green here because its programs stand out from the other 11 CCAs in a unique way, which is that all the rebates and incentives that they provide um, are exclusively offered to their low-income customers. We looked at some awesome programs that the rest of the CCAs had in the past, but in this report, we specifically focused on currently active programs, which is why those programs aren't listed on the screen. The second aspect that we looked at uh, were home charging and charger incentives that CCAs provided to their customers. Three out of the 12, yeah, three out of the 12 CCAs in our studies offer their customer rebate incentives for purchasing and installing home chargers, but we also found a range of incentives that came in other forms, um, including things like smart charging apps, partnerships, and rewards programs. Cal EVIP is an example of a partnership that most CCAs have with the California Energy Commission, which we'll refer to as the CEC. Through Cal EVIP, the CEC funds programs that distribute incentives for EV and EV infrastructure adoption across California. The third aspect that we analyzed were incentives for commercial charging networks. So seven of the 12 CCAs that we surveyed offered some form of incentive for commercial charging networks. These varied from technical assistance in the form of concierge services to rebates for chargers and installation projects. The table on the screen shows the rebates provided by 3CE, CPA, CPSF, and MCE. Additionally, PCE, SJCE, and SVCE all had projects in partnerships with Cal EVIP to promote commercial charging. These rebates differed in values for level two and level three direct current fast chargers, DCFC is how we'll refer to that. Um, and these are two different EV chargers based on their voltages. So level two chargers, which are lower voltage, offer slower charging speeds, more suitable for overnight or daytime charging in residential workplace or commercial settings. And then level three DCFC provide faster charging rates at a higher voltage, primarily for rapid charging along highways or major travel routes. So these rebates ranged from $3,000 to $8,000 for level two chargers and up to $100,000 for level three DCFC. And then additional value is available for electric vehicle supply equipment and infrastructure upgrades. And electric vehicle supply equipment, or EVSE, um, is the infrastructure and hardware used to charge electric vehicles more than just the charger itself. And next we have charging for multifamily housing sites. So the majority of CCAs we looked at offered some form of multifamily housing charging incentive. The most common incentives were rebates for level two chargers, many of which also provide technical support for planning and implementation in an attempt to increase accessibility for multifamily property managers and ease the planning and implementation process for them. These level two incentives mainly came in two forms of rebates, and those were either rebates specifically designed for multifamily properties or additional funding on top of already existing charging rebates. So the fifth element that we evaluated was incentives specifically for low-income and disadvantaged com community customers. Common incentives that we saw CCAs implementing included increased rebates on the basis of care and fair eligibility or specified income bracket eligibility and vouchers for purchasing EVs. Something that's unique to this project um, is that by collaborating with CCA representatives, we were able to compile data on the efficacy of a lot of the low-income EV and EV charging programs. An example of this kind of data is shown on the chart on the screen. Um, as you can see, 45% of all the money that 3CE gave out to us, its customers went to their low income customers in 2022. For a more extensive overview of this efficacy data, you can click on the link in the chat to see the infographic that we put together, which also reflects um, this data and what we found. 
So most of the CCAs partnered with Cal EBIP, whose programs already include an increased rebate amount for low-income people. And only three out of the 12 CCAs currently provide their customers with additional monetary incentives for low income separate from what Cal EBIP encompasses. As mentioned previously, Cal EBIP is a CEC funded program that CCAs can partner with to make more EV and EV charging incentives available to their customers. The Center for Sustainable Energy oversees the Cal EBIP program managing both its implementation and fund distribution process. The Center for Sustainable Energy is thus the sole entity responsible for determining how much CEC funding will be designated to low-income and disadvantaged communities across all Cal EBIP programs. I just wanted to, wanted to highlight here that the amount of reserved funds for low-income and disadvantaged communities under Cal EBIP is not a reflection of CCA initiative, but a management decision made by the Center for Sustainable Energy. Some CCAs have partnered with Cal EVIP to contribute additional funding to the rebate programs that their customers can take advantage of. And by doing this, CCAs are able to specify what they want that funding to go towards within the Cal EVIP program. So for example, if they want to add $4,000 to the pool of CEC money allocated to their customers, they can target that funding exclusively for level two charge chargers or 30% of it for level two chargers and 70% of it for DCFC chargers. So the benefit here is that they make more money available to their customers and can stipulate how that extra funding is distributed within their service areas if they want to. As far as programs for fleets and buses, our findings were limited. While several CCAs seem to include them in future planning, currently only three CCAs offer any form of fleet or bus program. 3CE's rebate program, which offers up to $150,000 rebate based on the class of EV that is purchased, um, is the only rebate currently available for, for fleets and buses. However, PCE and AVA offer comprehensive technical support through their replacement and transition plans. These plans offer a wide range of assistance, including aid with regulatory compliance, rebate and incentive applications, and determining vehicle and power needs for a fleet. PCE also offers energy optimization plans and an optional energy management service for fleets. Our final category was vehicle to grid or V to G, which is a technology that allows EVs to not only draw el electricity from the grid for charging, but also to return excess electricity back to the grid when it is needed to help balance the supply and demand of electricity on the grid. So we weren't able to find a lot of information on V to G on any of the CCA websites, but after interviewing representatives from each CCA, it seems that there is a CCA wide consensus that V to G is currently too expensive, the tech is too unknown, and most are focusing their resources on other areas currently. However, CCA representatives did convey that they are keeping a careful eye on the technology and are open to implementing it in the future if it becomes easier and the technology is explored a little better. So that is a brief overview of the findings of our research. Further details and information can be found in our upcoming report. Information on how to access the report will be available through UCCA in the coming weeks. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first CCA representative, Paige Callahan. Um, she is an energy programs analyst at 3CE focused on transportation and, ag and agricultural electrification programs. She also works on several strategic initiatives, including leading the annual programs portfolio evaluation and exploring new avenues to expand equitable electrification. Please welcome Mellon, or Paige. Great. Hi, everyone. It's super great to be here. I'm really excited to present um, on some of the work that 3ZE is doing. I think if it's okay, I'm going to share my screen and just show my own slides. Um, I'm sorry. I thought I stopped sharing. I apologize. Oh, no, that's totally okay. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Sorry, everyone. Okay. <laughs> so 
So thank you, Maya, for that introduction. My name is Paige Callahan. As Maya mentioned, I'm an energy programs analyst here at 3C. And I'm really excited to be here today to present on our efforts to electrify the Central Coast through community outreach and participation efforts in our transportation electrification space. So I'll first discuss a brief intro to 3CE and what we do, followed by an overview of Electrify Your Ride as our flagship program. I'll then go into our outreach and engagement strategies to help ensure enhanced customer participation across our programs, followed by a discussion about our analytical approaches to improve outreach and program design. I'll close with the way forward and some next steps that 3CD is implementing to improve our program participation with some conclusions as well. So 3CE was founded in 2018 and now serves 33 member agencies across our five counties on the Central Coast. We have approximately 450,000 involved customers, uh, whereby this number is expected to grow with the addition of unincorporated Slow County and the city of Atascadero in early 2025. 3CE's energy programs are designed to evoke meaningful decarbonization and climate action giving all enrolled customers an opportunity to partake in the fight against climate change through electrification and having a say on the energy that, they, that we procure. We have a commitment to fair rates and programs that meet the needs of our communities, along with an outreach strategy that helps meet communities where they're at. And finally, we placed a renewed focus on equity in program design, access, and in our participation indicators, focusing specifically on the impact of energy equity and soon energy burden as well. Our programs cover five key areas in the electrification space, building electrification, our transportation electrification, which we also provide uh, electric bus rebates, in the agricultural electrification space, we provide rebates for tractors and both small and large ag equipment. Um, we also provide programs for our member agency services. And finally, general support, such as technical assistance for electrification infrastructure upgrades and broadband assistance. Now, Electrify Your Ride is 3CE's flagship program. It launched in 2020 and to date has over $7 million in incentives given out to over 4,500 customers. This number is expected to grow as we've already seen record participation for this program in fiscal year 2023 to 2024. We offer additional incentives to income qualified applicants through uh, verification of the care FARA status, as well as tax verification um, based on household income and household size. So some of the rebates we offer include those for the purchase or lease of new and used EVs, and this can be up to $4,000 for income qualified applicants. For EV charters, we offer up to $700 for income qualified applicants, as well as $4,000 to help install um, panel upgrades and other um, upgrades to ensure that your EV charger will be work in your home and is safe and effective. We also offer incentives for our multifamily and commercial properties up to $20,000 per site. And most recently, we launched a DCFC or direct current fast charger available to both commercial and agricultural properties, which is a very exciting launch this past January. Now, I included this bit.ly link here on the bottom if you'd like to type it in now and kind of scroll through the site as I follow through this presentation. Electrify Your Ride prides itself on simplicity in the application process, the required documents, and rebate delivery, as this is key to a successful program that is as accessible as possible to all of our customers. While we have Spanish applications uh, available for in-person and uh, mailed-in apps, a multilingual integration to the online application will be available very soon in an effort to ensure um, language accessibility and language equity in our program space. So there are three basic steps to the stackable EV rebate. Once an applicant submits proof of purchase or lease, as well as a registration card and a driver's license, 3CE employees will verify the enrollment status and the eligibility of the vehicle documents. And once approved, applicants will receive an email confirming this approved app and then receive a check 45 days later. It's that easy. <laughs> All enrolled customers are eligible for one electrifier ride rebate, so one of the chargers, one of the cars, and panel upgrades once per year. 
And because of this relatively simple application process, last year we saw over 1,700 applicants receive incentives and spent $3.7 million, or 91% of the allocated $4.1 million budget. Now, these projects were larger carbon intensive fuel switching projects, so we saw an approximate avoidance of 3,200 metric tons of CO2. When looking at DMV data, we saw that 3CE rebates influenced approximately 10% of all EV purchases within our service territory, and 30% of the applicants for this program were income qualified. Of this 30%, 391 applicants held care fair status, which averages about 0.44% of all care fair customers. Now, how do we do this? How do we ensure that over 1,700 people each year can help access our rebates? It's largely thanks to our outreach, marketing, and communications team that employ focused and targeted strategies together. A three-pronged approach is employed through community engagement, customer service and education, and finally, marketing and communication. In community engagement, 3CE engaged with 44 local organizations and attended over 200 events in fiscal year 2022-2023. We conduct regular webinars, focus groups, and presentations tailored to our diverse customer needs, including bilingual education efforts and those specifically targeted for agricultural workers. We've allocated $1.6 million annually with targeted online print, and radio promotions, emphasizing our energy programs that have specific budget allocations to ensure that the programs are targeted towards those who would most benefit, such as the school bus system going to our transit agencies, agricultural transport buses, and public schools. Now, seeing this coordinated approach at work, last year, we reached over 400 individuals across 14 farm worker events, predominantly in Salinas, Watsonville, and Santa Maria. These events were facilitated by winning a radio contest on a Spanish-speaking radio show, whereby 3CE sponsored a lunch and learn about 3CE's programs right at the agricultural site. We support local initiatives such as farmers markets, community workshops, and regional events to enhance awareness and program visibility. While in the strategic partnerships, we collaborated with organizations such as Chambers of Commerce and Youth Centers to reach Hispanic residents in our underinvested communities. We've also engaged in bilingual events and other sponsorships to connect with Spanish speaking communities to help promote program accessibility. Now, while these strategies have been working to see a really high performance and continued growth of our programs, we want to continue to improve and refine the way we can analyze both our program participation, design, and outreach strategies. And normalizing participation data allows for this more refined analysis. We also want to use additional multifaceted indicators beyond income that will help target our outreach strategies informed through culturally competent ways. So this can include language, uh, language barriers, energy burden, and areas with poor air quality to consider these factors as well. Now, looking at the map on the right, we see a geographic information system or GIS map. And here we've overlaid EYR or electrifier ride participation with poverty percentiles. And so this helps us understand which areas have high participation relative to their poverty percentiles. It also helps us identify areas that may be facing additional barriers to electrification beyond cost alone, such as infrastructure availability. Additional analytical improvements can also include improving our website tracking and usage, as well as exploring the connections between ad spending and program application hotspots, which would also benefit from a GIS analysis. Considering these uh, analytical approaches and current strategies altogether, we want to continue increasing EV adoption within our service territory by evaluating our charging infrastructure gaps and affordability barriers in our underinvested communities through these data-driven approaches. As I mentioned earlier, energy burden will become a big focus of ours as we help to address or create programs that may be less capitally intensive. For an equity-driven approach in all that we do, we want to implement multilingual surveys and focus groups to identify and address barriers to participation. This will occur largely through our Priority Communities Outreach and Engagement Update, whereby we'll be conducting focus groups to better understand 
barriers to program accessibility, and other ways we can better support these communities starting in a few weeks. As we collaborate with other agencies to set specific and measurable goals for customer engagement, we'd like to utilize regular feedback mechanisms from the community in several different languages to better ensure that our goals are reflective of the communities we serve. And finally, we want to strengthen our partnerships with the community organizations within our service territory to develop targeted messaging with trusted people in our communities. All in all, 3CE wants to continue to offer flexible programs in the transportation space and beyond that meet the needs of all of our eligible customer sites. Types, excuse me. We want to focus on increased accessibility, workforce development opportunities, and targeted outreach through these meaningful CBO partnerships, ensuring that we meet communities where they're at. 3CE will to innovation, our regulatory engagement, and community feedback for effective, adaptable, and equitable electrification initiatives in a dynamic energy landscape, ultimately ensuring that customers across our service territory have equitable opportunity to partake in electrification and have a choice in their energy. And with that, thank you so much for listening to my presentation, and I look forward to your questions at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Paige. That was Awesome. Um, it was really interesting to hear from what 3C is doing. So yeah, we appreciate you sharing. Um, next up, we will be having Melanie Biesecker uh, present. She is a customer programs manager working on transportation and electrification at MCE. She oversees the EV instant rebate and MCE sync programs, um, advancing adoption of EVs and smarter, cleaner charging. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen and hear me okay? Yes. Okay, let me get everyone's faces off my screen. <laughs> as beautiful as you all are. Um, well, good morning. My name is Melanie B. Secker, and um, as you heard, I'm a customer programs manager for MCE, and I oversee transportation electrification programs including MCE EV instant rebates and MCE sync, which I'll be talking about today. Um, MCE is a public not-for-profit electricity provider with a mission to confront the climate crisis by eliminating fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions, producing renewable energy, and creating equitable community benefits. Our vision is to lead California to an equitable clean, affordable, and reliable energy economy by serving as a model for community-based renewable energy, energy efficiency, and cutting-edge clean tech products and programs. Uh, MCE serves 37 member communities across four Bay Area counties, um, which includes one and a half million or more customers. MCE offers several transportation electrification programs, which includes workforce, or I'm sorry, workplace and multifamily charging. I won't be talking about those today, but I'm going to be focusing on our EV instant rebates and smart charging app MCE Sync. Since 2019, MCE has provided EV rebates for income qualified customers. As of May of last year, MCE began offering EV rebates at point of sale um, using the self-attestation model, which has simplified the process and helped address barriers to participation. The program offers eligible customers up to $3,500 for the purchase or lease of a new or used plug-in electric vehicle at the time of purchase. The rebates are stackable with other incentives for more savings, and since the launch, we're successfully meeting our goal of increasing EV adoption um, by lowering costs and providing education to both customers and to car dealerships, which we have found is really important. The program also offers participating dealerships a or an incentive of up to $200 for EV sales through the program. So the way that it works, um, there is no pre-purchase application or approval. A customer just goes into a participating dealership and selects the vehicle that they would like to purchase or lease. 
the dealer will verify their eligibility on the spot and apply the discount off the purchase price at the point of sale. The dealership then submits for reimbursement and it's typically a two week or less turnaround time. If there, we, we think we have over 50 participating dealerships at this time and are um, continuing to add more. If there are dealerships that aren't already participating, a customer um, can reach out to the program and let us know and our team will connect with that dealership and try to get them enrolled. So here we have the eligibility um, to be eligible for this program. You must be an MCE customer located in our service area, purchase or lease a qualifying new or used EV or plug-in hybrid. Um, basically, it's anything that plugs in. Keep the EV for at least 24 consecutive months after the purchase or the lease, and then register with the DMV at the address associated with the MCE account. And the uh, customer must also meet income guidelines or be enrolled in one of the qualifying programs to the right. And this table here has been updated with the 2024 federal poverty level um, and income qualification for this program is 400% FPL. On the screen here, you can see um, we do have outreach materials available in both English and Spanish. Uh, they're available on our website. I included the link and I can also put that in the chat after my presentation. Uh, but we would love for anyone um, to help us share this program with eligible folks. And I want to move on and talk a little bit about MCE Sync. So here on the screen, uh, you can see a graph that shows uh, data um, sh showing the shift where customers are saving money and also reducing grid emissions to shift and shape EV load away from the four to nine peak when electricity costs are high. So on the left is um, the baseline and on the right is smart charging. EV ownership in MCE service area is among the highest in the nation at 5%. And this offers a perfect test market for innovative um, vehicle to grid, which uh, or VGI technologies that shift load toward those low cost hours when there's more renewables on the grid and helping with grid resiliency from outages during critical periods. We are continuing to um, influence charging behavior and optimize load from EV charging, maximizing benefits to our MCE customers, to MCE, the grid, and society as a whole. On average, 80% of EV charging happens at home, with every EV adding around 50% to your resident's overall electricity usage. So as the EV market continues to grow, the importance of smart charging is going to be more significant. So enter MCE Sync. Uh, MCE Sync is an EV smart charging app that launched in fall of 2021. It manages, um, helps to automate home EV charging to use the least expensive and cleanest energy on the grid. It offers a $50 signup bonus for customers who enroll and up to $10 per month cash back um, for participating in events. Customers um, using this app have saved more than $100 per year just by charging off peak. And it is uh, compatible with uh, home solar without any additional hardware and works with most EV makes and models. Eligibility for this program is also requires that you are an MCE customer living in MCE service area, have a compatible EV or charger. At this point, most um, vehicles and chargers are compatible, although there are some that we're still working to integrate. Um, and eligibility also um, includes that you must be enrolled in any residential electricity rate plan, um, although greater bill savings can be seen for an EV on time of use plan. And again, here we, we do have outreach materials available in English and Spanish. And uh, there is a QR code to the right. If anybody wants to learn more about the program, you can also reach out to me at any time.
thank you so much for letting me share a little bit about, oops, we don't want to play this video. <laughs> Pause. Uh, thank you for letting me share a little bit about uh, MCE Sync and EV Instant Rebates. Thank you so much, Melanie, for sharing. That was super interesting information to hear about. Um, our final presenter now is Brant Arthur. Grant is a program manager for Sonoma Clean Power. He works with customers and colleagues to build sustainable transportation services for everyone. His projects include a community needs assessment focused on transportation and mobility and working with customers to install workplace charging as a part of their research project. So here is Brant. Fantastic. Uh, it's really inspiring to hear everyone's doing. I'll just, uh, I'm really gonna focus just on one of our, uh, our offers today, but, um, Sonoma Clean Power is, we're the public power provider serving Sonoma and Mendocino counties. We serve about half a million people. Um, we are the only power provider in California offering 100% local renewable electricity 24 hours per day, every day of the year, um, which is amazing. Part of it is having the largest producing geothermal field um, in our backyard. And um, we have a number of EV programs. I think we started back in 2016. We had a kind of a bulk purchase and, and rebate program for residential customers. And we've kind of since pivoted more towards charging. Um, we still have a residential charger program for level two chargers, um, a smart charger program that's similar to what, um, very similar to what Melanie is, is doing with MCE. And uh, we have a Cali VIP program, a nonprofit EV rebate. And uh, we just launched an e-bike commuter grant to help um, workplaces um, get their employees to use e-bikes for commuting. But today I'm talking about workplace charging. So um, this is something that we think uh, really fits with how we see EV adoption going forward. Um, you know, the goal is really to provide reliable and affordable charging um, at more locations. And we think that the workplace um, is a great fit for that. Um, you know, we've seen EV adoption growing among renters at our office. So we started, um, we offer charging at our workplace from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Every, um, every spot in our parking lot has a charger. And yeah, folks who are renters have been able to, to get an EV that way. Um, you know, there's, there's data from the EPA that employees with workplace charging are six times more likely to drive EVs. And we think it's really essential for people who, you know, don't have a home charging op option. It, it, it can be expensive, you know, to install charging at multifamily housing. And probably that needs to ultimately happen. We think that this can be a really good stopgap. And most importantly, it helps move that charging, as Melanie was talking about, kind of the overnight charging peaks and, and getting that into, you know, spreading that out. So by having workplace charging, it allows folks to charge during the middle of the day when we have the abundance of solar power. Um, so that really you know, helps use more renewables to um, to charge power, or charge EVs overnight. You know, there is just more gas peaker plants, things like that running and uh, increases our grid reliability. Um, so this is a workplace charging site that was constructed through our Cali VIP program. Um, we're trying to figure out like, how can we do this more effectively for, for more workplaces? Um, so right now we're working with four sites to, to construct up, up to 20 connectors per site um, and offering them technical assistance and a $5,000 per connector um, rebate. And um, also looking at things like, you know, testing dispatch strategies. So how can we uh, manage charging to be better for the grid? Um, we are currently doing a community needs assessment. And we found that we looked at different groups of people, people who maybe were opposed to EVs, people who had EV intentions and people who were kind of like soon to be EV owners. And we found that, you know, in our survey, like just 11% of the soon to be EV owners had access to workplace charging. Um, and then we know that people don't get an EV until they know, you know, where they're gonna charge it on day one. So um, we think that that could, you know, really fill a gap for soon to be EV owners, which is a lot of people. 
in terms of where we are right now, we've uh, conducted, you know, about, I think seven assessments and we're moving forward with the first one. We, we think we're going to have four on board. This is assessing one of the sites, looking at their panel. It's really fun to go around to sites and um, look at their utility cabinets and understand how things work. Um, we found that companies with sustainability plans um, have budgets for things like this and, and are more willing to move forward. And we think that I probably need. going... Are we good? I'm almost done. Um, and so we, you know, we think that having kind of a no upfront cost uh, solution is really going to be needed long term. Um, like with everything, costs have just been higher. And um, one of the things we're trying to take advantage of too is the IRS has the alternative fuel uh, vehicle refueling property credit. So it's a 30% tax credit for the installation of charging that can help um, kind of stack with a $5,000 credit rebate, sorry. Um, you know, and we found that like often communities that have a higher amount of multifamily housing, um, you know, have higher needs that disadvantage in low income communities they have historically received less funding for things like the California um, EV rebates that have been available. So this is, you know, part of using the credits that are out there to um, to benefit these communities. Uh, and that's it for me. And I look forward to any questions. Thank you so much, Grant. Yes, thank you. I will uh, start directing some uh, questions at you. And the first one I think I would like to have all three of you respond to uh, in maybe the same order that you spoke. And that question uh, has to go towards any incentives for EVs or PHEVs, the plug-in hybrids. Um, are there any limits to what models that can be applied to, be it foreign versus domestic, uh, is there a minimum range on the plug-in hybrids or however you might be slicing that? Yeah, I can go first. So 3CE tried to keep it as broad as possible. The model just has to be 2015 or newer um, to be able to work with a lot of the newer charging infrastructure that's coming out. And super exciting, but in a couple of weeks, we're going to be launching a tool that we helped fund, which will help people find all the different makes and models that are eligible for 3CE rebates for electrified routes. So keep an eye out for that program that's coming out soon. Did you repeat? Yeah, the question has to do with EV or plug in hybrid. Uh, electric vehicles incentives, are there any limits, caveats, requirements, if you will, to uh, what kind of models or what kind of vehicles that can be applied to? Yeah, be it domestic versus internationally manufactured, or is there a minimum range, say, on the plug-in hybrid, things like that? Yeah, I can say for SCP, for a nonprofit EV rebate, um, it's eligible for uh, any vehicles that have at least 25 miles of range, you know, so that would be a plug-in hybrid. Um, I think that's probably all plug-in hybrids at this point. So, you know, uh, we, we can probably move it up, but. Yeah. yeah and for MCE, it is um, pretty much all plug-in vehicles. We do um, have a link on our website that lists out the different vehicles and we update it regularly with, as the uh, I believe the EPA updates their list. So basically if it plugs in, it should be eligible. Great, the net next question is for you as well, Melanie. I think you might've replied to it in the chat stream, but if you don't mind repeating it verbally as well, and that is uh, how is the dealer able to verify income at the point of sale? Yeah, so we, as part of the point of sale model, we use self-attestation for income. So the dealer will present the customer with um, the uh, eligibility requirements and ask them if they meet those requirements. And if they do, then the customer will sign a self-attestation form um, stating that they are eligible. 
which hey, is you. quite different than other incentive models where you apply ahead of time, go through a rigorous process to verify your income, um, which takes time um, and, you know, has proven to be a barrier for people participating in, in these types of programs. Next question uh, has to do with the panel upgrade bonus. And are there any technical requirements for those panels or other restrictions on what kind of upgrade panels can be covered as part of that bonus? Yeah, I can speak really quickly to that. Again, we try to be as accessible as possible and really kind of leave it up to the contractors that people hire to install them. So when we see the invoice, it's from the contractors um, and we just assume that it's correct because that they're a legitimate contractor. So we don't do any like further verification or anything as long as they have a permit to install it and um, is with a verified company, you're good to go. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, question for in any one or all of you. Uh, the What are the major issues have you run into on these EV incentive programs, be it on the dealership for that specific program or customer side as well? Challenges or issues? I put some comments in the chat related to that question. And I think you know, one of the things that we continue to see is it's confusing for customers and also for dealers. Um, you know, what what programs are out there? What are people eligible for? What are the requirements? Are, do you apply ahead of time? Do you apply at point of sale? Um, so stackability is really important for making sure that customers can get the most savings to purchase a vehicle, but it can be challenging to navigate. So, and, and the same goes for dealerships and understanding how to stack those programs at their at their sites and how to advise customers. I will say that all of all of the EV incentive programs do have support to help people answer those questions and find those things, but it's just making sure people are connected to the right folks. I can also say too, I know that when we did have a kind of general customer EV rebate. Um, one of the things we did, I saw a comment in the chat talking about how dealers will just mark it up to equal the rebate. And when we did it, there were only, you know, really a few EVs on the market. And um, we did a kind of a bulk purchase. So we negotiated prices with the dealers beforehand um, and then had them just display those prices um, when they were part of the program. I got my first EV through the program. It was really great. They just had like a table, like, hey, here's your prices. Here's what you're going to pay. Very simple, um, but it was a lot of work to work with those dealers. I didn't know if you had anything to add, Paige, to that question. We like same thing here, so thank you for sharing, guys. <laughs> <laughs> The next, uh, there was a couple of uh, pages kind of directed to you and not so much a question, but I'm going to try to reform it as one. A uh, couple of people in your territory uh, were kind of, I think, enamored by the app that MC has and were wondering uh, when, 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 or are you even thinking some, about doing something similar? Yeah, we are, which is exciting. It's really neat to see other CCAs that already have these apps up and going probably be coming to you for insights. <laughs> um, we're looking at launching our own kind of DR program and, and app in the next couple months to years, depending on just our staff and the timeline that we even, um, that we'll be able to establish. But it is something that's definitely on our radar because that off-peak charging and is such a, so important as well as having a really accessible way to reach our customers and give that information. Um, so it is on our radar, and we are working diligently towards it, but unfortunately, we just don't have anything to present on that quite yet. Thank you. Uh, another questioner, uh, after noting that the work, workplace uh, charging program is great, and followed on with a, is there an effort to identify workplaces specifically that employ all or more disproportionately more low-income workers. 
Yeah, for sure. That's something that's been in our mind and was really, you know, the goal here. Um, you know, it's, you can't just go to a workplace and, you know, ask them to, you know, divulge the, you know, income of their employees or, you know, what they're making. But, you know, we thought about, you know, reaching out to sites that employed more, you know, shift workers or service workers. Um, you know, I think typically in the past, these things have been like the CEO has their Tesla and like really wants to get, you know, charging for the, you know, their parking spot. And yeah, what we're looking for is really um, to get uh, sites to go bigger, you know, so that it's not just the, you know, one or two spots, but, you know, they're avoid people going out and switching their cars in the middle of the day. And um, yeah, I think, you know, as I said, we really have to go to a no upfront cost option to get some of these places that, you know, might might not be the company that identifies themselves as a sustainability company, you know, and is willing to throw this money out. But um, yeah, this has folks at all, all levels of the income scale. Yes, next question is a bit of a long one. So uh, great if you've already had a chance to read it uh, in my attempt to abbreviate it here just a little bit. CARB is currently updating its guidelines for the Community Air Protection Program. And one of those uh, categories is a local agency partnership projects. Uh, a slow county APCD is considering recommending CARB to allow air districts to partner with CCAs to augment the funding for the low income and disadvantaged Community rebate, community rebate programs. Uh, before they make that recommendation, do the CCAs think it could be possible for the, to them to accept these funds and be willing for CARB to claim the emission reduction benefits thereof? And directed at any, any one of the three of you. Okay, we have our tough question winner. <laughs> I, I mean, I could say I'm not familiar with the program. I, you know, it's something that we're trying to do is to partner more with community-based organizations on the development of pro programs. Um, it's kind of the heart of the community needs assessment um, that we're conducting right now with community-based organizations. And I think the next step beyond looking at needs is actually looking at, at solutions um, that are identified by the community. Yeah, I can add to that. With 3CE, uh, I'm not familiar with that program yet either. However, there is talk about partnering with our local air quality districts to better report uh, criteria pollutants in the way that we uh, calculate emissions avoidance. And so that is kind of the first step with partnering with our air quality districts, and I'm sure additional partnerships shall follow. Great, thank you. Andrew, we're going to connect you with them later. I need to move on to the rest of the questions. Okay, the next one are uh, POI. I don't know if that was supposed to be point of sale, uh, of sale rebates available from IR, IRA now, meaning 2024 is promised. Anyone know? They are. Yes. Okay, all right. I know it's a federal and, program, but. And I see Beverly's comment in there that the dealer has oh. to have applied or like enrolled in that and you're you're right and hopefully most of them are or have at this point we we've seen um good parties participation so far on our end all right good question for anybody on the panel how do ev charging incentive programs integrate or synergize with building electrification efforts I think that kind of touches on the vehicle to grid, you know, question that was addressed um, in, in the main presentation, which is like, you know, are EVs the problem or the, could they be part of the solution? And I think it's still really early days to, to know how that's going to work out. But um, yeah, certainly having some vehicle to load is a little bit less complicated than putting that power back on the grid. Um, if you have a building that can take advantage of that during the day. But um, yeah, the charging equipment is still being developed and it's it's expensive. I'll, I'll just say um, from MCE that uh, our EV, we, we do have 
EV charging for commercial and multifamily. I am not the expert on that. Um, if you have questions about that, I can connect you with my colleague, Joy, um, for details. But our MCE Sync program is specific to residential customers right now. But we are, you know, thinking about BGI technologies and also thinking about that um, and how it can apply to how how it might apply in the future to commercial and multifamily. But we're not there yet. Another uh, high up on the tough question list: multifamily housing. Uh, how are you, you know, trying to increase the adoption uh, at those, and particularly when many of them are on a uh, shared meter, uh, and then the rates, you know, time of use or not, and all those kind of aspects. Anything you're doing to try to increase the success of uh, charging and multifamily? The question is to all of our panelists. Yeah, something we've been speaking about with our equity committee here at 3CE is really finding ways to help identify some of these multifamily residents on a shared meter. Um, given sometimes it's really hard if there are multiple families um, but are listed in a single family residence, it's hard to identify that. So while we do offer incentives to electrify um, multifamily properties that are designated a multifamily, working with CBOs and building those trusted relationships is a really important first step to identifying these areas and these addresses really that uh, could benefit from enhanced electrification and rebates um, to help address the issue of shared meters. I didn't know if Brant or Melody wanted to add uh, any anything specific. Yeah, I know our experience is that, and maybe this is similar to 3CE's territory, but um, multifamily here is, is pretty, you know, it's kind of fourplexes and, you know, small owners of multifamily housing. Um, and it's, it's a big hurdle for them. And I've heard from a lot of folks that they're not, owners of multifamily housing aren't going to be incentivized until they can't rent out a place unless they have charging, right? Like that's that's the point where it becomes real. Um, I know that we've worked really closely with pg and &E on, on a direct install program um, in our territory that you know really covers all costs. And I think that's what's what's needed to be able to come in with technical assistance and just cover all the costs for for these sites. Uh, it also helps if there's like an activist tenant. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I we are at our hour. We're at time, uh, and uh, or, or do we have more time? Because I think if I'd there's like more questions, question. we can go longer. Okay, all right. Well, I'll just sneak in one quick question, and that is um, any surprises between you know when you might have done some. You know, market testing with these programs to actual implementation. Hopefully, pleasant surprises. But either way, any uh, you know, what is the top surprise for each of you? I think for us, it was when we did that map that I showed. Bringing GIS into an analysis of program participation has been really interesting to see. And like really start to understand which areas are facing additional barriers. And so that was the first time we were able to visualize that. So it was, I don't know if it was a pleasant surprise, but it was just surprising to see kind of this distribution. And it's given us a lot of motivation to start addressing some of the gaps. Yeah. And I don't know if it was a surprise. I think it's something that we thought we knew, but wanted to see if we were right. Um, but moving, uh, shifting our focus in the EV instant rebates program um, to strong dealer education proved to be really important and helpful um, for some of the rebate programs where you apply ahead of time. And in my previous um, life, um, working with EV rebate programs, you know, you could do you could do outreach to customers and 
get them interested and excited and then go to the dealership to purchase a car and then get to the dealership and the dealer doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, and there, you know, there's a lot of confusion, they get turned away. Um, and so we, we really shifted to a focus on dealer education and making sure that they were, um, they had everything that they needed to make the customer experience, um, successful, um, has been very helpful and, um, a large part of the success of our EV instant rebates program so far. Yeah, I think that's a great point about just the partners that you have. Um, I'll say pleasantly surprised uh, on that category. You know, we had a, a e-bike program that was just for income qualified customers, and that was really successful. And when we surveyed the plater, you know, um, you know, ninety plus percent of the folks still had their their e-bikes and were appreciating and using them. Um, and then on the challenging side, I think when we when we did our Cali VIP program, which is still going, but you know, I, we just assume that you can give people a really generous rebate and a treasure will be built. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think, you know, going back to what Melanie, you were saying about partners, we just realized that we need to be more involved in these things because um, there's a whole number of reasons that things, you know, don't go as planned um, if you're not involved. It was a question that uh, I, I hopefully won't misrepresent that I'm to kind of kind of summarize and say, uh, have you explored opportunities to leverage either amongst yourselves or other parties, federal or state, uh, on some of these tools, calculators, things that are useful uh, to make it certain when the incentives in, in apply or not, for example? I'm going to try to not misanswer this question, um, but just say that uh, there has been an effort amongst um, different program administrator, in, administrators for EV incentives to um, uh, collaborate and share best practices and learnings and, um, and different things to try to um, make things easier for um, customers and help um, create some efficiencies or some yeah, best practices. Yeah, I think CCAs have been really agreeable to chatting with each other and they've been really helpful. Grant and, I'm, Grant and I met a few weeks ago when we were chatting about equity initiatives for CCAs. So definitely even beyond just charging infrastructure and incentives, uh, it's always great to connect and, and learn new ideas as we're all kind of establishing ourselves in this space and continue to explore new options. Yeah, I think of CCAs as laboratories. And so, you know, sometimes even I'll say, oh, here's what MCE is doing. You know, maybe we can try something a little bit different just to kind of learn something, you know, between that difference. And yeah, really love sharing. You know, we're not competing against each other, but um, yeah, we're competing for success, I guess, if it were. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, both all our speakers, the College Corps fellows who made this happen and for everyone who came and joined us today and might be watching this after, afterwards please thank you please provide us feedback as i suggested earlier you have some subjects you'd like to hear about more in the future let us know that as well and with that uh we are concluded thank you